We build societies based on the technologies that we have available, on the social contract that we can articulate, expressing the mutual interest that we have in order to achieve our goals and uh, the ability to structure these goals in a way that reinforces the particular unit that the society encompasses. In this way, societies are able to self-perpetuate until the point uh, at which one of the components stops supporting it. Either a new wave of technology comes or the members of the society design and adopt a new social contract or the mechanisms that the society has employed undermine its own operations. For example, from an environmental point of view. We have had city-states of the ancient uh, Greece. We have had the uh, Roman Empire with its aqueducts uh, and uh, roads all leading to the city of Rome. We have had the uh, South and Mesoamerican Maya and Aztec and other um, societies and civilizations that have each embodied at their time what was possible. And it is the same today. When we look at the nation states that have tessellated the world to the point where there is no interstitial space uh, available anymore, wherever you go, you are actually uh, with your feet uh, walking on uh, the area claimed by a nation state, except Antarctica. We should not believe that the situation is static and that we have achieved a balance, an equilibrium that is never going to change. As a matter of fact, if societies that today are expressed in the nations or aggregations of nations like the European Union didn't evolve, they would collapse the evolvability of their components is itself a good indicator of their adaptability and as a consequence potential longevity. The resilience of nations is their ability to go back and forth, left and right, experiment uh, with one kind of uh, trend or opinion that is able to attract a large number of people. In the case of democracies, those people voting for the promoters of those ideas or those trends. And then at the next election, realize that um, they were wrong and course correct. And this uh, ability is very important changing our minds, uh, the Greek word metanoia, the ability to realize that you were wrong and to change your mind, applies not only to individuals, but societies, nations as well. And that kind of reckoning is healthy. It is healthy to uh, learn from the mistakes. It is healthy to grow with those experiences, hopefully not repeating the mistakes in the future. So representative democracy also need to uh, evolve. We have certain nations that uh, have proportional representation. Others have first past the post representation, 
majority presidential uh, republics and so on and so forth. Many different varieties, which is also good. Um, an emergent system of managing elections is becoming more and more popular called ranked voting, where rather than expressing a single preference, you express a list that is according to your first choice, but if that were not available, the second choice, the third choice, and so on. And when the ranked votings are tallied, what we achieve is neither the rule of the majority, which oftentimes uh, still uh, is uh, has the implication of going against the uh, wishes and the desires and the aspirations of a very large minority, whether it is 20, 30, often 40, 45, 49 percent. Neither we have the rule of the minority where proportional representations uh, need to create coalitions and paradoxically the minority coalition member originally attracted into the coalition uh, yields a force and a power that is greater than they uh, a priori uh, were expected to, to be able to, to wield because by uh, telling that uh, they could withdraw from the coalition, they have the ability of um, having the hypothetical uh, government fall anytime. Ranked voting uh, creates a solution to both of these and it is uh, a, a solution that is being adopted in more and more uh, situations. This is just one example for governments and governance in general to uh, be evolving. And uh, of course, we have uh, other uh, tri tri types of uh, uh, agreements, other types of uh, organizations, whether it is the United Nations or the World Health Organization uh, or uh, the agreements uh, that uh, uh, are regulating uh, trade, financial flows, uh, services uh, on a global level as part for example, of the WTO uh, or uh, other emerging um, global or regional agreements as well. These create a complex and evolving set of support systems on which we can build solutions that our technology can take advantage of. An example of a technology that takes advantage of these agreements are the container systems that have standardized global shipping. And thanks to that kind of standardization, global shipping has been able to greatly increase um, moving goods from uh, places uh, where they could be produced efficiently to places where they were desirable and they could be sold at a profit. This was already what would happen uh, in prehistoric times under a barter system. But of course today it is possible in creating supply chains uh, that uh, uh, encompass the entire planet. Opposing to that, of course, uh, we have an understanding that uh, these supply chains can be brittle and we then constitute and incentivize uh, those that are more local uh, and can withstand uh, the potential breaking up of uh, global agreements and, and the ability of uh, building products uh, globally while still supplying, for example, pharmaceuticals or technology products uh, uh, to a continent rather than to the entire planet. 
we are in dear need of ideas that can be tested, of people who are courageous uh, to show themselves fallible and able to analyze and learn from their mistakes. The perfectibility of our solutions is at the very basis of their evolvability, of their future fitness for purpose. If we had a market in societies and in nations, we could actually decide what is the expectation of future fitness of a society to gather to the needs of uh, their uh, components. Similarly to how we have a market for um, companies where the stock market and the stock price incorporate the market's expectation of the ability of that corporation to generate profit in the future so that their products are attractive to customers and they can be sold while making money. And as it turns out, we do have such a market. We can measure whether a given society or nation is expected to be able to generate uh, future fitness. And it is through the legal and illegal immigration flows. Look at what are the nations where emigration is larger than immigration. Look at those nations where, to the opposite, other people want to come in, even desperately, even risking their lives, because they realize that their the country where they were born doesn't give them an opportunity to thrive and maybe even to survive in the coming years. So they'd better leave. They want to leave. And if you look at these flows, what you are looking at is actually a stock market for nations where people express their desire and their uh, future expectation with physically moving or attempting at least to move from one place to another. And then, of course, the smarter of the societies can take, um, can, can, uh, take action, can decide what they want to do, because these can be objectively measured and they can be correlated with policies, with conditions, with decisions that in turn can be formulated in political programs. They can be formulated in decisions that shape the future of a nation, of a society. I hope that it is going to be possible to have rational conversations around this in order to manage what, as a consequence of the expected increasingly rapid shifts in climate, are going to imply in terms of flows of people. We have to be forward-looking. New technologies are coming. These new technologies support new ways of living. New ways of living can give rise to new types of social contracts. And our imagination is such that we can dream and we can then realize those dreams of just inclusive, empowering societies that give opportunities to thrive in the future for all.